This past week, Maxine dropped in theaters, so today I'm gonna stop and rank all three movies in the X trilogy from the weakest to the best. Hi, my name is Sean and I love to talk about movies and TV way too much. With that in mind, go ahead and join me down below in the comment section, share your ranking of the X trilogy, and let me know your thoughts on it as a whole. As for me, I feel like I don't love any of the individual films as much as I would assume that most of you love one or more of the individual films, but I love that a trilogy like this exists. I want more things like this to exist in the world, and I love that you have this peculiar trilogy where each individual film is tackling a different subgenre of horror, they're set in different decades, they have wildly different aesthetics, but there is kind of a shared set of characters and a thematic through line running throughout the entire thing, so it really does make sense and work as a trilogy but in a whole new way. Likewise, it was made very cheap, but it looks very cool. Um, it does interesting things. It has a wonderful aesthetic to it. And in my mind, this is the example of like all of these people out there making these generic movies that all feel the same. And then Ty West comes along and makes this trilogy for as cheap as he does. And each of the movies pop, they stand out, they leave a mark. And I'm not wild about all of them but each of them left its own individual impression and had its own thing it was trying to do, and I love that. But what's my ranking? Let's get started. In third, Maxine, and this is a frustrating one. I really wanted to enjoy this film more than I did on the whole, because there's so much in here that's really great, where it has this wonderful 80s aesthetic where both in the look of it, the way that it captures the 80, 80s stalker thriller vibe, the look to it, we're taken to a time and a place. You feel like you're in 1980s Hollywood. You feel like you're watching a 1980s stalker thriller. It captures that perfectly. It's also populated by a lively set of characters. Of course, Mia Goth is the standout there as Maxine, and she's just really fantastic in all of these movies, and she continues to be in this film. But all of these little side characters with Kevin Bacon showing up, Giancarlo Esposito playing a character besides Gus Fring, just all of them are lively, fun to see on screen. But when it comes to the actual plot itself, I don't think that it, it fully, fully worked. Some of that is that the central mystery, I just felt was so obvious where it was going. Kit Laser, one of my fellow online critic friends, wrote a tweet that said this, Maxine is a whodunit in the same way that Blue's Clues is, which is a very brutal way to say what I think is true of this film, which is it, you know exactly where it's headed. <laughs> the pieces are so obvious that anyone can piece this together who's gonna be behind everything that's going on. And also, as you move into the third act, a lot of people thought it went too weird, too wacky, and hated it. I, I didn't hate it, but I didn't find it fully satisfying either because it just felt so much like, oh, okay, yeah, that, that's where I thought this was going. The other one that I think really held this movie back for me is I felt as a thriller, there weren't nearly enough thrills where you have kind of two different stalker killers in LA taking people out. You have multiple sequences where people are killed or you're showing kind of the lead up to their death. And I, I just never felt it did, did a good job of building actual tension in those situations. I didn't feel the danger or they were too quick or just played out so matter of fact that it was about the gore, which there's some nice nasty gore kills in here at times, or not even kills this one in the middle that someone gets what's coming to him and doesn't die. And perhaps he w one wishes that he did, but uh, you get the good gore, but I didn't feel the tension in the sequences. I didn't feel the growing tension and danger throughout the film. And I think that's just so pivotal to a movie like this. If you're going to make a whodunit thriller, I need to feel on the edge of my seat and you have to be able to be at least be a little bit smarter than me with the twists, turns, and reveals. And I didn't have either one of those things. 
So the performances are fantastic. The characters are great. There's some nasty gore that I loved. The aesthetic, the vibe is all wonderful. But at the center of the genre, it didn't deliver. Our runner up, X, the movie that kicked off the entire trilogy in a film that really kind of felt like it came out of nowhere where there wasn't a ton of marketing and then all of a sudden it was like, hey, this movie called X is coming out. And as soon as the movie played, they're like, by the way, there's another one coming out in six months. And then that one came out and by the way, there's another one coming out in a couple of years and set up this whole trilogy in world that was so much more interesting and rich and dense than it would immediately seem from the basic synopsis of this film. On paper... This is just a, a, a standard homage to Texas Chainsaw Massacre, where some people drive off in a van to the middle of nowhere, they stay at this, it, this obscure little cabin attached to a house, and the people in the house start killing them, Texas Chainsaw Massacre style. Simple enough. But in the execution... Ty West brings in so much kind of more into it where it's so thematically rich for such a, an overplayed plot line and exploring this idea that, you know, time catches up with all of us and the, the nature of ambition and what we want in life and ideas about communication and different expectations between people and relationships. There's all of these little things in there that are much more profound and emotionally satisfying and resonant than make any sense to be in a movie like this, traditionally speaking. Like, you care so much more about the characters, you care so much more about the killers, and all of it just has more oomph and weight to it. And you start to realize how much that even these tried-and-true genres... These slashers that have been, we've been making them for 50 years now, there's still more to explore there. There's still more that can be brought to the table. And in the most unlikely of places, a slasher about shooting a porno, you can explore the human experience and understand ourselves a little bit better. And um, I don't know, that's just kind of what was impressive. But now, for, as for me, this is a movie I probably respect more so than I fully enjoy the specific subject matter on people going out to shoot a porno and the relationships with some of the characters and stuff. Uh, not exactly my cup of tea to, to just re-explore and go back to a bunch to and not connect characters that I, I relate to at all. But that doesn't change the fact that I think that, that Ty West did something very impressive. But coming in at number one, Pearl, one of the most unexpected prequels and horror films I have ever seen, where X, homage to 70s slashers, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and then they do a prequel about the old lady and what was she like growing up, what made her so cuckoo, and it's an homage to The Wizard of Oz, <laughs> of all films, and... Once again, on paper, that sounds so wild and wacky. And then you watch the movie and somehow it makes sense. And the movie is doing this Wizard of Oz aesthetic. And there's times where it just shifts off to kind of the daydreams that are going off in her mind. And then we go back to the horror that is her real life and the insanity that is her real life. There's something which is just so captivating about the entire experience. We're just swept up into this twisted <laughs> wonderland of sorts that we're off into. And I think a big part of it is just Mia Goth's performance where she is so good at playing this aw shucks, innocent psychopath, <laughs> where at, in certain scenes, she just seems so sheltered from the world while also not being that at all. And she seems like someone that needs to be protected from the world, that you're, you're helping her acclimate to the complexities of this life only to realize she's so unbelievably unhinged that she's the real threat. There's all these scenarios where people kind of take pity on her and try and help her, shelter her, guide her, comfort her. 
and you buy into it, you can see why anyone would feel that. And then you can so quickly watch the transition, the moment where it clicks. I'm I'm with cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs over here. And then when she goes into full-blown crazy mode, it's so convincing. It's this character that is way out there in left field in this very odd film, but feels totally believable because of the performance. And there's so many just little details all throughout the entire film where you, you'll have like these gorgeous shots of a farm or a scarecrow and then a pig covered in maggots. And just the unsettling details all throughout it that just keep making for just the the perfect vibe. So for me, this is the one that I enjoyed the most, that caught me the most off guard, and that just I just stuck with me afterwards and had me thinking about it, wanting to talk about it. And like, she, my wife doesn't want to watch the movie, but I wanted to show her sequences from it of just what Mia Goth was able to do. So for me, it comes in at number one. If you enjoyed this video, I've ranked a ton of other horror franchises. You can find them over here in this playlist right over here. I've done all the big ones, Friday the 13th, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, whatever it is, I've done almost all of them. Hey, thank you so much for watching and keep talking movies and TV too much.